Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the process that we we select images to create our final composite images that we then do the reef mapping from. And we're looking at the process of setting up the Google Earth engine to be able to do that process and the process of um, selecting which images we should keep. So here we've just set up a new repository in the Google Earth engine. We have copied over from the Git repository, oops, the draft Git repository, two of the source files. Um, you can see one here which we've copied into our Google Earth Engine space. And then we've um, and we've selected a particular scene where we're looking at Boot Reef here. And we've selected the date range so that we're going to step through all the images that have a cloud cover less than 1% over that date range. And we can see that there's 19 of them. And because we've picked an area that's close to the um, equator, there's actually a lot of clouds. And so a lot of the images get excluded through this percentage cover. Now, when you're going through this process, often you will find that maybe 19 images isn't enough, or in some places you might find there's only like two in which case then you might go back and actually increase the cloud cover percentage to get a few more images. Um, in this particular image, we can see that this particular patch, this is a particularly bad image. It's got lots of sun glint, it's got lots of clouds, we can just see the reefs. Um, and so it's not a good candidate for keeping in our final composite. But what we can see is this transition between where the sun glint is being removed and where it's just been left in the image. Basically, the algorithm that we have in there tries to segment the image into land areas and water areas, and it applies sun glint to where it thinks it's water, and it applies just a, a constant offset for atmospheric correction on areas where it thinks it's land. Um, but we're using the infrared channel to do that process. Unfortunately, at some threshold, the land brightness equals the sun glint brightness, and we can't tell the difference. And so we can only do the sun glint correction up to a certain point, and then we just can't tell the difference. We could apply sun glint correction up even to brighter sun glint, but then the imagery where it's land would look really bad. Basically, it wouldn't do a good job of the land and the, the Ks very well. So this is a compensation. Pretty much if the sun glint is that bad, then it's probably not going to end up being a very good image anyway because the sun glint correction is not perfect. OK, so let's go to the next image. Now, it takes a little while to render each image because the Google Earth Engine has to apply the code over that image. Oh, there's a whole reef there we didn't see before. Uh, now this image, hardly any clouds, quite good, but too much sun glint. Um, so that's not great. Now, each image that comes up we can see on this it gets listed here and effectively what we're going to do is when we find a good image is we record this because this is what we're going to put into our final source code that's going to generate the composite images let's go to the next one Now, this process would be probably far quicker if we could speed up the Google Earth Engine, but another one where the sun glint is not good. 
Now, some scenes you'll find almost every image is perfect and wonderful, and you'll be like, oh, I'll just keep this image and this image and this image. I've picked a particularly bad spot here. So the other thing that you can see here is sometimes because of the way the Sentinel satellite, it takes images on an angle. So it does like these wide swaths that captures imagery on an angle as it's orbiting around. But then when they're cut up into imagery, they're cut up into rectangles, which don't actually directly align with those swaths. And so you find that some of the times you know, it's taken an image on that date, but it's only half the scene that we're interested in. That means that we need to collect imagery both for the right-hand side and the left-hand side to make sure we've got coverage um, everywhere. That's not a great one, although it's, maybe it's okay. Actually, I should go back. Ugh. Okay, now that we've gone through a bit of imagery and we've seen that generally it's pretty bad, at some point you'll go, I'm getting desperate to get some decent imagery. And so maybe you'd go, okay, well, at least you can see some of the reef. It's, it's not too bad, right? So we're looking at this image here and then we start to record them. So for this, I would use... Uh, notepad editor and you record that and I would probably um, start categorizing them it's a maybe so I've been using categories which are excellent now excellent is basically there are no clouds there's no sun glint it's just a great image. <clears throat> and then good, which is there's hardly any clouds, um, and those clouds generally don't fall over the top of the reefs. There's no sun glint. It's a good image. And then we have OK images. So this will generally be there are more clouds in the image, um, but generally not too many over the reef. Also no sun glint. Generally, I exclude any with sun glint because um, the way the composite image works is it's taking the median of all the pixels of all the images that you throw into it, and it'll do masking out of the clouds to try and stop those influencing the final median. But the sun glint will contribute a lot of noise into the final image because it's quite it's so much brighter and so it'll sh potentially shift the median up quite a bit um, and it's for large areas so I've just sort of taken the general rule that we just exclude any that have any uncorrected um, sun glint. Okay let's see if we can find another okay image yeah, no we I think after doing this process you start to appreciate all the um, imagery where you have the final beautiful mosaics that are perfectly cloud free. And the other thing that this is doing is we're ruling out 99% of the images already <laughs> due to the filtering on the clouds. Oh, this is an interesting one. Now, this particular So each image has a whole bunch of different stylings applied to them <clears throat> that are available for rendering. So at the moment I'm showing this deep false styling, which is actually based on ultraviolet blue and green. 
and it's designed to show to provide deep penetration into the water column in clear water. Now, as we get close to the PNG coast, there's actually the water is not nearly as clean as the rest of the Coral Sea. And so the thresholds that I've applied to do the contrast enhancement are not quite tweaked very well for this spot. Um, I'm going to go through and improve them slightly by adjusting the code. But from our perspective of selecting the images, we're only interested in determining whether it's a good image from lack of clouds. We can see a lot of the reef features and that sort of thing. The actual refinement of the final image, the way it will look, is that'll be refined over time. But we can look at um, a different rendering. That's a contrast enhanced true color. And that's the true color one. So in true color, it actually kind of looks pretty normal. Now we can see that there is some cloud over the reefs. But other than that, this is a pretty good image. If this was anywhere else, I probably wouldn't include it at all. Um, I think I would call this one still a maybe in sort of quality. Um, and effectively what we want is wherever there's a cloud, the really tiny clouds won't be filtered out by the cloud masking very well because it doesn't pick up really small cloud features, um, which means if we want the statistical median to get rid of the cloud, there needs to be more images where it's just blue than cloud. So if I included a whole bunch of images and more than 50% of them had cloud in this location, then when it goes to take the median of all the pixels at that location, it would go, oh, okay, most of the time this is cloud, therefore that's what the image should be. And that's what ends up in the composite image. Um, and so while it tries to, to reduce that effect, it applies a cloud masking to the image to try and reduce that as much as possible. Um, but that cloud masking doesn't tend to pick up tiny little reefs. But it does mean, sorry, tiny little clouds. Um, but it does mean like if I'm trying to reconstruct a nice image for this region here, then I'm going to need a few images to get a reasonable estimate of that median. Um, so essentially we're always, if we've only got maybe images, which tend to have quite a bit of clouds, you probably want to have at least eight images for the median to be a reasonable estimate of the, the color of the reef. If you've got okay images, you want at least about four images. And good, you can get away with, well, probably two to four, and excellent, two would make a pretty good image. Um, obviously, if you've got lots of excellent images, let's say you had eight excellent images, that will make a better image than one excellent image because it'll be doing statistical combination of all those pixels, reducing the sensor noise in the final image. And because we're stretching those images a lot to try and peer very deeply into the water, the noise gets amplified in that process. And so if we can combine many images together, then that noise gets reduced and the detail of those deep features becomes much, much clearer. Um, and so we're really trying to get as many images as possible with the trade-off that each image that you add, so if I added, if I had, let's say, four excellent images, and then I added a, a maybe image in there, 
then this one would actually make the additional one with all the extra clouds would make the image worse because it would actually add noise from all the imperfect masking of the clouds and all that sort of jazz. So it's a little bit of a balancing act of trying to collect as many images as possible so the median will come out nice, but not introducing additional noise from imperfections in the images. Okay. So we'll get... So Emma's just asked whether there's a way to weight the images based on the quality of the creation for the creation of the composite. Potentially, um, because but it'd be extremely difficult to implement because the cloud the cloud detection is imperfect. And so from the algorithm's perspective, it doesn't, the residual noise it, from the clouds, it doesn't actually know where they are. So at the pixel level, it doesn't really know whether it's a perfect pixel or not. You could have a weighting of this is a bad image, this is a good image, this is a not so good image, and then apply that weighting across the whole image. Um, and essentially that's what we're sorting the images into. And the other thing is what we're doing is we're collecting these and then we're gonna create two images from it. One image which is made up from the very best of the images. And then the second is a second reference image from all from the rest of them pretty much. And then we can use those two images to the, use the first one for most of our tracing. But then if we've got a situation where it's kind of like, we've got this little blip in that image, is that a real thing? Or is that actually just an artifact caused by something like a small feature cloud that came into the image and was imperfect? So then we can look at the secondary image and see whether the the artifacts are the same, so whether it's a real feature or not. Um, yeah. Okay. So this image here looks similar in sort of quality, not that great, but okay. Well, maybe. All right. So I'm going to say, for argument's sake, that we've got these three images. So I think we'll do the next step which is actually creating a composite from these images. Just so that we've sort of gone through each of the steps. So now to create the composite, well, actually, I'm going to add the second script in here, which we'll go through, because there's four scripts that we have in the library. Copy it over, paste. Okay, so this particular script, it's intended to, well, let's say we've just stepped through all those images and then we're like, oh, I'd like to review the classification that I applied to those images. Maybe I went through half of them and I couldn't decide whether they should be okay or maybes and I just, I don't want to step through the original set because maybe I picked 10 images out of 50 images and I don't want to have to step through the 50 images again to review the 10 that I actually chose. So this utility is allows you to simply grab a list of images and then it'll step through just those images. So if we wanted to review the three images that we found before, then essentially what we can do here is put them in here. I thought I did three images. Did I forget that. 
Oops. Now, one thing you'll notice is if I paste these in, these are all syntax errors. These have to be all as arrays, so they all need quotes around them. And they need commas between them to make it a valid array. For this particular one, these um, you just replace whatever's in there because this utility is designed to just look at a particular set. It's not a permanent record of those images. And so, yeah, this is a fine way to do it. Now, if we run that, then essentially we should be able to look at just those three images and then to review them. Again, it takes a little while to get running. This little bar here shows you the progress of the rendering of that particular image. So that's where to look for. Is anything happening? <laughs> okay, so here we can see one of three images. Uh, it doesn't list the image here, but you can kind of see the count, and usually you're not dealing with many images. At this point, you can also look through these different stylings. We can look at where it thinks the reef tops are which you can see it thinks a lot of clouds look like reef tops because this is just a threshold applied to the red channel. Um, basically, looking at reef tops only really makes sense in a cloud free image. Um, you look at the stretch red channel, green channel. So yeah, this is a utility just for looking at individual images. Okay, so now we'll get the utility for creating the composite image. Did I call it the wrong name? What happened there? This should be called number two. I'm not sure what happened there, but anyway, that should be that code. <laughs> I have to go back through the video to see what happened. Okay, so this image here Sorry, this not image. This scene, this code, calculates the composite scenes and renders them out using these particular styles. Now, I probably should have listed all the style names there. I think I've accidentally copied over a version which I need to go back. Um, so here we've got Boot Reef, and these are the images that we used. Um, here I've recorded what percentage cloud cover we use in our selection process. 
said there were not enough images to create a second reference image. Um, so usually we'll like here, for example, we've got two images. One is the, our primary reference image and then our secondary, which has the less good images going into it. Sometimes they're just not enough good images to really split it into two because all of these ones are basically marked as maybe in quality. Um, and so, yeah, as I said before, ideally you would have like eight if you've only got maybe images. So if I split this into two images, I'd only have three each, which would be not enough. So we just decided, OK, just one single reference image. So where there is a scene where there's very few images um, and where you can see I've actually gone through all the images, then we're probably not going to make any improvements. So when Rachel goes through these to actually improve this list, there's probably little point in ones where I've actually looked at all the images. But in other scenes, like you can see here, I've searched 40 out of 65, 30 out of 43, 30 out of 60 and so on, then there's extra images waiting there to be incorporated into the composites to make them better than what they were. Additionally, when I was doing the filtering, um, there is a slight trade off between like if I've got quite a few images available, let's say here I've got three good ones and two OK ones and then a bunch of maybes. Um, there is that question of do I include an image or not? Like each image that I include, does it make the image better or worse? So for example, if I made a composite of all of these images, would that be better than if I just made a composite of just these five? Sometimes it's not entirely clear or obvious because you're trading off, perhaps this image has clearer water but slightly more clouds or perhaps the clouds happen to be over the reef or perhaps this one has slightly more waves in it. Um, and so the perfect combination of images is you would almost certainly include any excellent images, probably all the good ones. Once you're getting down to OK images and you're trying to, you've got the potential for making a really good image, then if you've got time, then you could try dropping certain images out from the composite and tr looking whether it really makes much difference or not. So that was where I thought, you know, that's another sort of somewhat time consuming task to work out the best strategy for doing that, which I didn't do at all. I just went into the four categories and then sorted them based on that and then didn't look back and just moved on. I suspect that the tweaking of whether that image should be included or not probably doesn't need to be done on most of these areas. It's when you've got um, scenes where there aren't any great images that it gets more important to make sure you've got the best images in there, the best of the worst images to go together to make the composite. Okay, so. I'm assuming that if we went through all 19 images, we probably would end up with a similar list as this. Um, and then if we wanted to actually look at this composite, we've got two um, settings. Is this doing online completion? No. Um, if we want to look at what those things actually do, search for this function in the utilities. Oops. Mm. 
So those booleans are should it generate a display like display layers in the map for that composite, and should it export the image to Google Drive? So in yes. Um, so in this case, this one isn't going to generate anything. It's not going to make any map layers and it's not going to export it. Generally, as you work through them, you might process them in batches. And so when you're working on one, you might first initially set it to true. And then when you think it's all good, then you would export it. And so then you'd set that to true. And then when you're all done, you'd set it back to false. And that's basically saying, yeah, I'm, I've, I've done with that one. So you can see here, this one's true. These will be this, that one will be displayed. Generally, most of them should all be falses because they'll generate lots of layers and stuff, which kind of gets in the way. Let me just, we're looking for these false, that they're all false. So if I set this one to false and then just have a look at our composite. Now I can't remember, I don't think this composite will automatically zoom to the location. Um, and so you kind of got to know where the tile is that you're actually looking at. The reason is the composite you could actually pass in multiple different scenes into one composite and it would just build an image with multiple scenes in it, a bigger image. Um, you can also see that, oh, by default, it creates the layer in here, but doesn't turn it on. <laughs> so nothing will happen. You'll just be sitting here going, what the hell is going on? So you go and have a look. And then when you enable it, it will actually render it. So the Google Earth engine has a process where it does lazy execution where a job or a whole sequence of calculations will only be triggered if they're going to come out somewhere, like either to the display or to export or something like that. So if you tell it to create a whole bunch of display images, it won't actually calculate them until you actually turn them on, then it'll start calculating. So here we can see the final composite image um, rendered in the deep false styling. And it's not a very good image. But to some degree, this is actually outside the Coral Sea Park, <laughs> Marine Park. Um, both of these are outside the marine park, but they're on the edge, and so we'll still continue to process them. These ones, they've clearly got deep lagoons. Um, our best bet for getting any better imagery of these, if we're trying to look in the deeper features, is probably going back through the Landsat 8 imagery. Um, and doing a similar process on those. But I think for our purposes, this image is going to be probably good enough. Now, each of these styles which gets generated is listed. Well, actually, if we go to the main data set here, You can see this is the generated for the draft image. You can see there's these styles, deep false, deep marine, reef top, shallow, and true color. And then these are the second reef reference images, which I only bothered to do the two forms of it. So the deep 
false color is the one based on the ultraviolet blue and green and the deep marine is is a contrast stretching of the true color imagery so it basically tries to really stretch those the reef top is an estimate of where the reef tops would be just by the a threshold applied on the red channel. The shallow uh, is based on false colour. Um, probably back. And the yeah, true colour is an estimate of what they would probably look like. Um, so here, for example, if we wanted to include true color, so in the long run, we'll we'll add in all of those to do the final rendering. I'm thinking I will probably add another one, which will look at the green channel and give us an estimate of the 25 meter depth contour. Um, so here you now you can see there's two of them in here and if we look at true color. Uh, that looks pretty good actually. <laughs> the true color one doesn't have nearly as much contrast enhancement, which is why the, the little bit of noise that's come through here is not, nowhere near as evident in the imagery. So for shallow features, it's it's pretty good, uh, even with that noise. The other thing that we clearly need to adjust is this version number, because now we're doing the production version number. We need to export with not B0. Um, yeah. Okay, so now if I wanted to actually export one of these and download them, I could have it true and true if I also want it to display as well. Now when I run this, then what it'll do is generate this task, which is these are the things that will export it to the Google to Google Drive. Um, and you actually have to click on them to actually run. So if you run the script and you don't click on these, there's no time wasted and no files are generated. Um, but let's say we run this one, then it'll give you a default set of names, which are fine. The path is usually fine if you've made that, corrected it. Make sure you correct in the script, set it to version one. The file name's usually fine, and it'll generate a GTIF. And in this case, I'm storing it to Google Drive. Um, by default, if you've got a, just a normal quota on Google Drive, I think you get 15 gigabytes. Each of these images is about 300 megabytes. You can generate them and then delete them. Um, and so you can do them in small batches that way. I think I'm paying $2.50 a month to get 100 gig. Is it a month or a year? It's some small amount anyway. Maybe we can set up cloud storage. There's another way of getting it off. Um, so then when you trigger that, to run, it'll sit there in the background and run. They typically take about 15 minutes to run. And you can also do many of them in parallel if you've got the storage space, because they just all run in parallel on the Google servers. Um, you can also go back and see which ones are running. Now these particular, um, this interface doesn't really update very automatically. And so you'll be sitting there an hour later and it'll still be 
looking like it's going and nothing's happened. And even in here, it's a little bit mysterious as to how to trigger it to go, yes, I'm actually done. <laughs> I think a refresh generally helps, and then you can see whether it's done. And then to find it, you would log into your Google Drive, which you can do through the web browser and then download the file from there. Now, in theory, you don't need to do any of those tasks. My original plan was that uh, Rachel would focus on finding the best images using task one, sorry, script one. You can use script two to review those to help with any decisions along the way. And then they would be recorded in script three. Um, and you could look at the composites to, to see whether they're looking good or not um, to help you make a decision as to whether you should include certain images or not. And then that becomes the deliverable. The set of images is the deliverable. And I guess this code here, the notes about what percentage was used, how many images were looked through, that's the deliverable. And then um, running and downloading all of those, I'm quite happy to do because then we do the subsequent processing in Python to create them into web TIFFs and so geo TIFFs for publishing on the web and such. And then we'll work out a way of distributing those to everyone um, in an efficient manner, whether I just publish them straight to the web or, and then you can access them from there. Okay, any questions? Oh, you're on mute, Emma. that better yeah no yep. thank you that was really 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 cool and presumably if we're taking this code and running it in our own google earth engine accounts we're not causing any problems or messing anything up it's like it's safe that's the only thing i was scared that's about. right <laughs> yeah so as you copy across the code into your own space you can do effectively whatever lists and then once you've compiled the set which you think is the good set then we'll copy them back into GitHub or share them another way and then we'll, we'll coordinate getting it back into GitHub as the final set. Um, yeah. So I might finish this video at this point and then we will perhaps talk about some other things and maybe we'll see how we go.